Welcome everyone to this week's broadcast of Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your co-host, Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And today our very welcome guest is Dr. Clarissa Kripke, Director of uh, Developmental Primary Care at UCSF. But before we get into her discussion, Will, what's with your shirt today? I'm, I'm wearing my Presidio Volunteer shirt. I'm a regular volunteer. I, I'm a regular volunteer with Presidio Stewarts. I volunteer, uh, I volunteer with them in, in the areas in the Presidio, including Upper Lobos, Mountain Lake Park, Dragonfly Creek, and, 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 the, and, and the Hilltops. Thank you, Will. I appreciate that. Uh, could you now begin with questions for our guest? Tell us about your background and how you came to work in the autism community. Thank you, Will. I'm glad to be here today. I am a family physician that's a general physician who takes care of people from birth to death and all types of, of people, regardless of what their diagnosis or condition is. And I got interested in taking care of people with developmental disabilities because they started to show up in my office and the typical a 15 minute appointment was not working very well uh, in, in a distracting office and in, in a typical doctor's office. So I offered to start doing home visits for some of my patients who have more complicated medical and behavioral um, disabilities and that started my career focusing on people with developmental disabilities and providing them with primary care, uh, primary medical care to help maximize function and help maximize participation in all of their activities of daily living and in work and in their communities. And then after I started doing that work, my own daughter was diagnosed with autism. And so I became a lot more interested in how the medical system serves people with developmental disabilities and how it doesn't. And she is now 21. And so I have been a member of the autistic and autism community ever since working with her, supporting her. Uh, she's non-speaking and has severe dyspraxia. So, uh, so I provide a lot of support at, for her to be a leader in the autism and autistic communities. And, and I work with a wide variety of people with autism and other developmental disabilities and autistic people. Tell us about your background and your current work at UCSF. So after I went to college and medical school and did a three-year residency in family medicine on the East Coast, I did a one-year fellowship in medical editing at Georgetown University. And then I came to San Francisco to join the faculty at the University of California, San Francisco. And I have been a family physician there ever since. And I teach medical students and residents and I take care of patients. I started off as a general family physician doing, taking care of all types of people. And then my interest gradually grew to focus more on people with developmental disabilities and their support needs because people came to me saying that the medical system was not doing a good job of helping people with developmental disabilities and autism to get good care. And I could see it. I could see that we really were not listening well. We were not communicating well. We were not providing the services and people and autistic people were having health problems that were not getting addressed properly and were having 
uh, poor health outcomes as a result. And that wasn't right. So I started to do home visits. And then people started to know that I was interested in taking care of autistic people and people with other developmental disabilities. And so they came to me, uh, the health plan, the regional center agency, Golden Gate Regional Center, and my health services research colleagues and uh, and service providers like at the ARC, uh, the ARC of San Francisco. And we started to write grants. And out of that grant work to try to improve the healthcare system, I started a program which we call the Office of Developmental Primary Care. And our mission is to build the capacity of the healthcare system to serve transition age youth and adults with developmental disabilities. So we weren't doing a good job. And the goal of my program is to improve the job that we're doing. Tell us about some of the major health challenges you see in, in your research. So I participated as a community advisor to a research study that was done by Lisa Crowen's group at Kaiser that took a look at that issue. What health problems do autistic adults have? And we found that autistic adults have higher rates of just about every medical condition there is from cancer to heart disease, to lung disease, to psychiatric disabilities. Uh, the, the rates were higher for almost everything uh, that we looked at. So I don't think that that is necessarily because of anything about biology, although biology might have something to do with it. I think it's mostly because we haven't been doing a good job of providing good healthcare services and good services to autistic people. And as a result, people's health is not what it should be. Thank you, Will and Dr. Kripke. Um, our cultural uh, correspondent, Stacy Kennedy, has a question for Dr. Kripke at this point. So would you say in the neurodevelopmental sense that, you know, how you help others understand and educate them on autism, would you say that that would be a contribution to people with autism and other developmental differences that would help, you know, thrive with their other medical health, you know, concerns? Absolutely. I think I realized early on as my daughter was getting diagnosed, we were part of a civil rights movement that autism was another difference like being gay or um or being a woman or it was it was an identity and it was a valued difference and that we were in the early stages of a movement to gain acceptance to gain appreciation for the gifts that people with disabilities bring to our communities. And they are, they are vast and important. And, and so I think that growing up in a society that doesn't understand that and doesn't always believe that and doesn't always act like that and acts um, and doesn't make a distinction between illness and disability and who thinks that the problem is the person instead of the problem being the environment and how people are treated and included and provided opportunities. That's, that's the problem. Uh, people with disabilities get sick like everybody else does, but they aren't sick. And when we treat people better, then they have less anxiety, they have less stress hormones and they're healthier. And we've seen that in other communities where people are discriminated against that as our society learns to accept people better, their health outcomes improve. And I'm seeing that in the disability community as well. 
Dr. Ripping, I understand one of uh, the main areas of your interest in your practice is dealing with anxiety of uh, various individuals. Could you go into some detail about that? Yes. So psychiatric disability, including anxiety, is extremely common in people in in the general population, but especially in the autistic population and the population of people with developmental disabilities. And part of that, like I was mentioning, is environmental, that a lot of people have experienced traumas, traumas from not being understood, traumas from being excluded, traumas from being mistreated. And sometimes that can lead to lifelong anxiety because people can't trust that they will be accepted when they go out into the world or that they will be their communication might be under misunderstood or their movements might be misunderstood and that can be very stressful one of the things that we have studied is a new concept of autistic burnout and i am part of the aspire community based participatory research team and that is a group of of doctors and professionals and researchers, as well as autistic adults who come together to study topics that are of importance and interest to the autistic community. And we noticed in the in talking to each other that some people experience that a lot of people experience burnout, which is not like a normal, I'm just tired, but a real shutdown of ability to do basic activities of daily living or to do their jobs. And they really have a very difficult time for an extended period of time and it doesn't respond to simple rest. I think that is often because people need supports and can't access them and they need more help and they can't access it. Or some people describe masking, trying to pretend that they're not autistic, uh, which is extremely stressful and um, and to, to cover up any, to cover up who they are basically. And that can be extremely stressful. And so that can lead to anxiety as well, to symptoms of autistic burnout. A lot of autistic people have sensory differences, sensory processing differences, are very sensitive to certain lights or sounds or have synesthesia, which is a uh, brain processing sensory input like, um, like colors or music and then seeing colors or having different emotions associated with those things in their brain, the way their brain processes things. And so having having different perception, different ways of experiencing the world and sensing the world can can also lead to anxiety and stress because our because our society is not set up to pay attention to noise pollution. There's cars are noisy, trains are noisy, homes make fans and other electrical sounds are all over the are all over uh weed whackers, um, bright lights. There, there's a lot of sensory input in our environments and we haven't paid enough attention to that. And that can make, um, that can also create anxiety. Uh, I, I think if the world were designed by autistic people whose perceptions are sometimes a little different than neurotypical people, then they would pay a lot more attention to noise pollution and sights and distractions in our environment, and we would all be calmer and less anxious. Um, attitudes can also lead to anxiety uh, if, when people are encountering negative attitudes or criticism or social exclusion. That can also lead to a lot of anxiety and also, anxiety can be a result of medical issues like thyroid problems or diabetes, uh, or can be a side effect of medications that people need for other conditions as well. So there's a lot of reasons why autistic people can be anxious. I think it's almost almost universal that people have some some degree of it, and for some people, it's it's very disabling, um, and we can do better 
to prevent it by being more accepting and uh, treating it by not only helping the person, but also by creating more welcoming and calming environments. Excellent. Thank you. Along those lines, um, I'd like to dovetail. Uh, you'd mentioned some things that would um, help with the anxiety condition that uh, many in our community face. So I'm going to do a little thought experiment here. Let us say you were the czar of, of this particular issue. What particular changes would you implement right now to improve uh, the welfare of our community in this respect? Communication is the foundation of patient care. It's the foundation of public health and it's a human right. So one of the first things I would do is make sure that every person has access to communication. If they're non-speaking, if they can't use speech reliably to communicate, uh, everybody would have access to alternatives so that they could express themselves. Next thing I would do is make sure that nothing about us without us, that autistic people were always at the table when any issue about our community is being discussed. So that means that we would have more health professionals who are autistic. We would have more researchers who are autistic. And that's why I enjoy working with the Aspire team so much because we're working directly together with people who bring research expertise and autistic people and parents and people who are service providers together to design research together as as a community so that and, and as equals um, and we would have so we would have autistic people at the table we would have communication and then those I I think those are the two things the two places where I would start and then accommodations for being able to access healthcare. Tell us about some interesting behavior traits you see in autism students. Well, autistic people are very varied. What I teach my medical students and residents is that if you have met one autistic person, you've met an, one autistic person. So people have a wide range of intellectual and cognitive abilities, a wide range of how they communicate. Some people don't communicate with speech at all. Some use augmentative and alternative communication like voice, uh, like uh, typing or using a, a voice output device. Um, you have people who have very different motor skills. I, there are autistic people who are professional surfers and autistic people who use wheelchairs and autistic people who have very little use of their hands to do fine motor skills, people with dyspraxia. You have people who have seizure, uh, a low th seizure threshold and who have seizures and people who don't. You have people with mental health disabilities uh, some um, some are extremely calm and very controlled and orderly, and some have a lot of anxiety and a lot of movement. And um, that basically, there is no autistic trait that goes with every autistic person. And so, there's such a variety; it's hard to even answer that question. Uh, autism is defined in terms of observations of behavior. It isn't a specific trait or characteristic. And so people can behave in atypical ways for lots of different reasons, because they have difficulty controlling their bodies, because of all sorts of different neurological reasons. And so I don't think autism is any one genetic condition. It isn't any one trait or characteristic. It isn't any one neurology. 
there is a wide variety of neurologies and traits and characteristics. Finally, Dr. Kripke, um, are there any upcoming developments or projects uh, in your group that you'd like to tell our community about? One of the things I'm really excited about is the work that Aspire is doing to have autistic people themselves define what a meaningful outcome measure is for service provision, for services. So what if you are receiving services or supports for your disability, what are the outcome measures that matter? Can you communicate better? Are you less anxious? Are you, do you, uh, do, are you satisfied with your services? Is your health good? Um, those are the types of outcome measures that autistic people say are important to them. And so we are developing a set of tools that service providers can use that are developed with and by autistic people. And we're testing them to make sure that they measure what we hope they'll measure and that they work at, so that we will know whether the services that we are providing are making autistic people's lives better at, according to autistic people, not according to physicians or psychologists or anybody else, but according to autistic people. And I think that's really exciting and really new. We're also doing work on autistic burnout and on employment and other areas that are important to the community. I'm also excited about all of the writing that that non-speaking autistic people are doing and all the teaching and growth of the non-speaking autistic communities um, that of the non another thing I'm excited about is the work that the non-speaking autistic community is doing to educate the broader autistic community about their needs, about their interests, about their skills and contributions. More and more autistic people who are non-speaking are getting access to communication and are participating in research, are, particip are writing books and are giving presentations and that community within the autistic community is really developing some amazing leaders who I think are really going to improve services, are really going to improve our understanding of autism and the neurology of autism and are going to improve access to healthcare uh, through the insights that they provide. So I think that's another really exciting area. That was excellent to hear, Dr. Kripke. This is very exciting. Uh, and we look forward to uh, more developments in that area and uh, hearing good things uh, from you as well. Uh, now, what we will do is we'll hear from our book correspondent, uh, Jennifer Brooks. Uh, thank you, Keith. And today I'd like to tell you about a trio of books by author Trudy Ludwig that deal with an experience that children with autism are all but guaranteed to experience and that's bullying. The books are My Secret Bully. This one deals with a form of bullying known as relational aggression, also known as social exclusion, where one girl who used to be best friends with another girl suddenly decides to shun and exclude her and turn other girls against her for no apparent reason. Trouble talk. This is about a girl who engages in malicious gossip, spreading rumors, largely of the she's so fat she should have her own zip code variety. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we've all known somebody like that. And last but not least, this is uh, Just Kidding, which deals with uh, what most of us think of when we think of bullying, where one kid likes to tease and taunt and torment another and then laughs and says, ha ha, just kidding, you know? 
It was a joke. Can't you take a joke? No, it's not a joke and it's not funny and it's not right. And it's not acceptable, even though society has the attitude of, well, if you don't want to be bullied for being weird, then you just shouldn't be weird. Okay, so here is an excerpt from the introduction to Just Kidding about that point. Targets of bullying need to know that the bully is fully responsible for the harassment and that nothing the target did or said caused the harassment. Even if the target is different in some way, is overly sensitive to teasing. I mean, come on, who isn't sensitive to teasing? What exactly does it mean to be overly sensitive to teasing? Or has Asperger's syndrome or another disability? Well, do you mind? The bully still made a choice to tease, threaten, or hit. The bully is the one who did something wrong. Yes, and the bully needs to be told in no uncertain terms that their behavior is not acceptable. Even if their defense is, it's not my fault, she's so weird. They can say, yes, it's not your fault, she's so weird. You know what? It's not her fault either. She was born without the ability to understand social cues. We'll now hear from our cultural correspondent, Stacy Kennedy. Hello, everybody. Um, Sunday, let me rephrase that, Sunday, July 23rd, uh, around 10.30 a.m., um, there's going to be this um, Sensory Sunday, which is designed for the guests, for guests of all ages who are neurodivergent, have sensory sensitivities, or have a different time, you know, in difficult time, excuse me, in large groups, uh, especially in museum settings. Um, this is going to be run by Curie Odyssey. Um, I will give more info on that. You can also go to eventbrite.com to look up this um, Sensory Sunday event. Uh, in order to offer a variety of sensory experiences, uh, spots will are limited and uh, reservations are required. Mm -hmm. um, photos will be taken during the event and may appear in the organization or foundation pages. Um, and you are to notify the front desk, you know, staff upon arrival of which, which you attend, um, if you don't want your pit picture on the pages or so, if they happen to take it. So the location will be at Curio, Curio, <laughs> Curiodacity, as in Curious, right? At 1651 Coyote Point Drive in San Mateo. Um, so yeah, exploring exhibits and, and galleries and playgrounds, it's designated for breaks as well. Um, there'll be dimmed lights and seating areas and it's free. Uh, Friday, July 28th will be San Francisco Giant um, celebrates Autism Awareness Night and um, the 15th anniversary for um, ANOVA, which is an organization, and there's other organizations that are going to be there with their own table and so on. But ANOVA, I picked up this free STEM toy last year, um, which is very nice. Um, plan to pick up more if they have them there. So July 28th, Friday, uh, Autism Awareness Night, San Francisco Giants. Well, everyone, that's uh, this week's uh, program. Until next time. I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. I'm Stacey Kennedy. I'm Jennifer Brooks. And I'm Clarissa Kripke. And we're Ascend TV Live on the Autism Spectrum. Until next time, stay well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.